the DNA is telling us. So doing the Y chromosome work, I found that there wasn't a link between Richard III and the male line relatives who are alive today. A car park in Leicester held proof that the English royal family has been hiding a scandal for five centuries. When they pulled a twisted skeleton from the ground in 2012, everyone assumed it was just an archaeological find. Identify the bones. Confirm it's Richard III. Close the case. But the DNA told a different story. Yes, the skeleton was the king. No question. But his bloodline was wrong. Broken. Fraudulent. One of the tests didn't match living descendants. Someone in the official royal line wasn't actually royal. Either Richard himself was illegitimate, meaning he had no right to the throne he seized, or his brother Edward was the fraud, making Richard the rightful king betrayed by history. Science can't tell us which, but it proves one devastating fact. The dynasty that ruled England was built on a lie nobody discovered until now. To understand why this matters, you need to know who Richard III really was. England, 1483. The country had been tearing itself apart for decades in a brutal civil war called the Wars of the Roses. Two families fighting for the crown, Lancaster versus York. Richard was a York. His older brother Edward had won the throne through violence and become King Edward IV. When Edward died suddenly, his 12-year-old son should have become king. But Richard made a shocking move. He declared his brother's children illegitimate, bastards with no claim to the throne. He locked the two young princes in the Tower of London, and they vanished from history. Then Richard crowned himself king. His justification? He claimed his brother Edward had no right to produce royal heirs, that Edward himself wasn't legitimate. Everyone assumed it was just propaganda, a lie to steal power. Until the DNA results suggested otherwise, Richard's claim wasn't random. Whispers had followed his family for years. The rumor centered on his mother, Cecily Neville, a powerful noblewoman known as Proud Sis. According to the gossip, when she became pregnant with Edward in 1442, her husband Richard Duke of York was away on campaign in France. The dates didn't line up. Court insiders began whispering about an English archer named Blaybourne, tall, handsome, and conveniently nearby when the Duke was absent. The baby Edward grew unusually tall for a Plantagenet, towering over his supposed father and brothers. When Richard seized the throne 40 years later, he weaponized these rumors. His own mother's alleged affair became his justification for taking the crown from Edward's children. Historians dismissed it as medieval propaganda, dirty politics from a desperate man. After all, Richard had everything to gain from spreading lies about his dead brother's legitimacy. But what if he was telling the truth? Fast forward to September 2012. A team from the University of Leicester begins digging in a city council car park. Historical records suggest this was once the Greyfriars Friary where Richard's body was dumped after he died at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. Most experts think the grave was destroyed centuries ago. On the first day of excavation, they find human remains. Then they notice the spine, severe scoliosis, a twisted back matching descriptions of Richard's alleged deformity. The skull shows massive trauma, a blade driven deep into the bone, battle wounds, the skeleton has ten injuries total, inflicted around the time of death, two fatal blows to the head. This looks promising, but they need proof. Medieval skeletons aren't exactly rare in England. The team carefully extracts DNA samples from a tooth and the thigh bone. Now comes the wait. Can science definitively identify a king who died over 500 years ago? The scientists chose two types of DNA testing. The first used mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA for short. This genetic material passes from mother to child, virtually unchanged for generations. Sons and daughters both inherit it, but only daughters pass it on. Think of it like a family recipe handed down through an unbroken chain of mothers and daughters across centuries. The team traced Richard's family tree through the female line. His eldest sister, Anne of York, had daughters who had daughters 
who had daughters, continuing for 17 generations. The line led to a man named Michael Ibsen, a Canadian-born furniture maker living in London. His maternal ancestry connected directly back to Richard's sister through nothing but women. If the skeleton was really Richard, his mtDNA should match Ibsen's perfectly. The lab extracted samples from the skeleton's teeth and leg bone. Weeks passed. Then the results arrived, and they were stunning. Perfect match. The mtDNA from the skeleton matched Michael Ibsen with 99.999% certainty. A second descendant, tested independently, confirmed it. After five centuries under a parking lot, after the grave was lost to history, after everyone assumed the body had been thrown in a river, they had found him. The skeleton was definitely Richard III. The discovery made global headlines. Historians celebrated. The University of Leicester planned a royal reburial. England's most controversial king would finally get a proper funeral. The mystery of his burial location was solved. But the research team wasn't finished. They had collected enough DNA for a second test. This one would track the paternal line using Y-chromosome DNA, passed from father to son through generations. It should confirm the mtDNA results and verify Richard's royal bloodline through his male ancestors. They ran the test, and that's when everything fell apart. Why chromosome DNA works differently than mtDNA? It passes from father to son in an unbroken male line. Only men carry it. Only men pass it on. If Richard was legitimate, his Y DNA should match living male descendants of his ancestors. The researchers found five men descended from Edward III, Richard's great great grandfather, through an unbroken chain of fathers and sons for 19 generations. These men descended through the Duke of Beaufort line. Their Y DNA should match Richard's. The results came back. No match. Not even close. Richard's Y DNA was completely different from the Beaufort descendants. Even stranger, the Beaufort descendants didn't match each other either. Somewhere in the family tree, at least one child was born to a mother whose husband wasn't the biological father. A false paternity event. An affair. A secret. But when did it happen? And to whom? That's the question nobody can answer. The DNA can't pinpoint when the break happened. It could be anywhere across 19 generations. But one possibility stands out as historically explosive. What if Edward IV really was illegitimate? The timeline fits. Richard, Duke of York, was indeed away during the conception window in 1442. Cecily Neville was at court. The archer Blayborn was there too. Edward grew unusually tall, unlike anyone else in his family. And here's what makes it staggering. If Edward had no royal blood, then his children had no claim to the throne. The princes Richard locked in the tower weren't legitimate heirs. They were pretenders, which means Richard III wasn't a usurper who murdered his way to power. He was the rightful king, the only legitimate son of the Duke of York. Everything we've been taught about the villain of English history could be backwards. The monster might have been the hero all along. We'll probably never know which scenario is true. You can't extract DNA from Edward IV. His body was lost when Henry VIII destroyed his tomb. Richard, Duke of York's grave, is gone too. John of Gaunt's remains were scattered centuries ago. The science stops here. But here's what we do know for certain. Someone lied. Someone in that royal bloodline wasn't who they claimed to be. The DNA proves it. 500 years of history built on official records, careful genealogies, and legitimate succession. And somewhere in that chain, there's a break, an affair, a secret that died with the people who kept it. Richard III spent his entire reign defending his right to rule, fighting accusations that he was a murderer and a tyrant. And now, centuries after his death, we discover his family tree is broken. Was he the rightful king, history denied, or just another pretender in a dynasty of lies?